Welcome to the Winning Move podcast, guys. We have an entrepreneur who I respect, one of the best entrepreneurs I know, Jason Hogan. I spoke at a mastermind with him, Josh Pettigrew's mastermind, a while ago, and I thought he was such an exceptional human, exceptional speaker, and it's very, you'll see today just how vulnerable he'll be with everything else, but I think he's a great entrepreneur. Jason, bro, thank you so much for coming on. No, thanks, man. It really means a lot. Uh, thank you so much for letting me be on the show. It's crazy uh, meeting you back in, God, that was what, a couple years ago, two years yeah, ago? Yeah, that was a couple years ago. Yeah. When I met you, bro, you guys had done $300 million that year. Yep. Yep. It's, it was crazy. God, it was crazy. A lot, has, a lot has happened since then, but uh, good, good things, bad things, you know, whatever. I mean, it's hard to say bad things because it's just lessons and opportunities to get better, but it's been a very interesting couple of years. Bro, let's start with like... Um... I think your father did an amazing job because not very many people come out like you with a dad like yours, who's right. very successful. And then I thought you came out exceptionally. I remember talking to you about it. I was like, bro, you're amazing. How did this okay. happen? How did your dad raise you to be like this? So I like, talk about your childhood and everything else. Yeah, our childhood was crazy. I mean, I fortunate I mean, I had I have the most amazing mom and dad. I I mean, they're they're the best. Um you know, and they, you know, got, I grew up ex with a lot of wealth, um, which was good. I mean, I'm not going to say that it was bad. Um, but the biggest thing with my mom and dad is they, you know, their money was their money. Our money was our money. And they flew on their jet. That was their jet, not our jet. We flew commercial. I mean, they, like they. That's wild. Yeah. Like we did our own thing. They did their own thing. Um, you know, it's funny because I have a couple, uh, reels on Instagram that have gone viral. Me talking about my childhood and people are like so upset at my mom and dad of, you know, how could they do that to you? And it's like, you know, this and that. I'm like, I totally agree. I, like I, I, you know, that they had their business partners and their people that like, were, that it was very important for them to be on that airplane and that business stuff. We're freaking little kids, man. They just throw us on in commercials and we'll just, we'll just end up in the same place. And they had to do their meetings and be effective with their time, which, you know, it, it was fine with that. But, you know, they really taught us hard work. Um, they taught us, you know, a lot of, a lot of different things in business. Um, you know, they made us read books from a very uh, early age. They were public speakers all over the world. And so we got to watch them public speak all over the world as well with a lot of, you know, celebrity like people that, you know, were real big in the nineties and early two thousands. And I guess, you know, mid, mid 20, 2010, 2020, I don't know what you call them, the tens and twenties. <laughs> and, um, it was really cool to be, to, to watch them, um, do that. I wish I would have, been a little bit older because a lot of their bigger business was when I was very, very young. So I didn't get to see a lot of that. Um, mm -hmm. But it was just really, I mean, they do, they made us have a time clock. Like we literally had a time clock where we clocked in and out of jobs at home. And, the, you know, there was no chores or, you know, things where we just, you know, did them just because, or, I mean, we, I mean, we had, uh, or, or just got paid. I mean, we had, you know, we didn't get allowance or that. We had to literally clock into jobs. Um, including the dishes, including, you know, doing stuff in the yard, including cleaning garages, all that stuff. We had to literally clock in, write the reason, and then clock back out and, like, printed the tunnel time stamp on the card. I'm the only person that I know growing up that had a time card <laughs> um, from, you know, when I was, like, five years old. So it's a very interesting uh, childhood and got to travel all over the country and just yeah, had an unbelievable upbringing. And, and they taught us. So I'm so grateful for them. I mean, if anybody in my position – you know, wouldn't have taken that opportunity, evangel opportunity. You know, I, I don't, I think, you know, how could you not? Um, you know, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm a twin and then I have two older siblings and we're all very, very different. Um, I had some family working for our business for, and, you know, just, we're very different, but it's just, it's interesting childhood. Bro, uh, what was the biggest lesson you got from them overall that you think besides like hard work? Um, watching yeah. them all those years. I always say it on my, my social media, but they always say like, if it is to be, it's up to me and you create your own destiny and you live, have to live an intentional life and everything that you do every single day is your choice and your decision, good or bad. You make good decisions and bad decisions, but really taking ownership and control of your life is something that they taught us and you can't blame anybody else. I mean, you have to live in the world of self accountability. And if you're rich, it's, you know, that's because of you, if you're poor, that's because of you. I mean, Obviously, there are some circumstances that sometimes we can't control, but at the end of the day, we can control ourselves and live intentional lives. And, you know, that was very impactful from us very, at a very beginning because, you know, my dad would always say, you know, we were, we were huge in a basketball growing up. I mean, we even had a basketball, really cool basketball court in our house. And we had a personal trainer come in every single day. I mean, it was, 
we were going to the league for all we knew. And my dad is always like, you know, you're the reason why you're not going to go to college. And that's it. And, you know, there's, there's okay. talent. There's, I mean, a lot of, a lot, there's a lot of kids in college off of pure talent. Yes. But there's a lot of kids in, co- in college and in, you know, playing on Sundays or playing in the NBA, just a pure hard work. And we know those, yep. those workhorse players that, you know, maybe aren't going to be an all-star, but they're going to be in the league for 10 yep. years because they just do their job. And my dad is like, there's no reason why that can't be you. Um, but it's a hundred percent up to you. And that's just the lessons that he taught us. My mom taught us all growing up. Bro, talk about how you learn how to judge the intentions of people at a young age. Because I think that's a very, very interesting thing to be able to take away at such a young age, too. Yeah, I mean, it it's, you know, having the house and kind of the lifestyle of the family that I had, and we owned a bunch of restaurants and real estate, and so everybody wanted to hang out with us because, you know, me being a little bit cheap, we're going to the restaurant we get free food at, you know, and so everybody wanted to hang out with us. And it was cool at the beginning because you really thought that people really liked you for you. Um, you know, and then going up to mom and dad's house, I mean, it's a 30 acre spread, you know, 20,000 plus square foot. We had a paintball field, a shoot, like we could do anything we wanted up there. It was, it was so remote that, I mean, you could, you could do anything you wanted up there. It was the coolest, coolest place to grow up. Um, but we kind of found out that like, I mean, really through like, you know, starting to hit in uh, junior high and high school, that people really were just using us and wanted to use us for the things or for the house or for the cloud of being around us. And, you know, they might meet someone up at our house that was at a meeting with mom and dad or whatever. And so it kind of at the, at a very early on age, just really started to get a smaller circle, a a way smaller circle and people just coming up because, I mean, I didn't even throw parties because I was like, why, why am I going to throw a party? It's just a bunch of fake people want to want to come up to a cool house. Like it doesn't, there's, yeah, that doesn't fill my cup up. And so, Really in junior high, high school, I just had, you know, a handful of friends that were really the loyal friends that would be there no matter what. And just creating that, you know, that that really small circle. And it's, it's you know, I, I love everybody. Like, I'm not going to tell you, you know, I'm not going to be rude to you or whatever. Like, we did have, you know, sometimes a group of people up there. But um, really, like, my circle was really small because a lot of people out there just, you know, it, they come into your life for a reason or a season. And, some, you know, if, if it's for a season – Obviously, it's for a reason, but, you know, some of those people are lifelong friends that I still actually talk to today. Are any of your friends who you grew up with, are they in business currently or no? Uh, one of them. One of them um, is, well, a handful of them, but one of them in particular is actually one of my best friends. I actually was with him today at lunch. Um, we're, we're with each other all the time, and he's extremely successful. He, big construction company, owns a lot of real estate. He's actually a year younger than me, um, but Uber, I just like, man, like I just... He was telling me some of the projects he's got going on today, and I'm just so proud of him and happy for him because I remember, and we both talk about this, I remember when he was in ninth grade, I was in 10th grade, and we both, I mean, he came from, you know, uh, well, what he thought was kind of like a more poorer family, even though his dad was extremely wealthy. He just had no idea because of all this real estate, but he still to this day acts like he's broke, but I think he owns over 100 houses, pretty much outright rental house. I mean, dude's just yeah, doing it, right? Um, but I remember like shooting basketball, I'll never forget this moment we talk about all the time of like, Hey, like, what would it be like? What would life be like? Imagine if this was our house, what are we going to do? And like, we just kind of, we both feel like we can go back to that moment in time of like our like true bond started and like our business buying started like turning and his started turning like crazy too. And it was cool to see from like really that moment to what you know we got going on now. I actually worked for him. When I lost Is that your construction job that you were yeah, working at? Yeah. So I, he's the, he's the, he's the guy that, um, saved me. And, and I lot when I lost everything, I was sweeping his floors and installing cabinets. And, you know, he's just that type of dude. He didn't even, he didn't even blink an eye. He's like, yeah, sure. Come on. Like whatever you got to do, uh, for your family. Just, you know, if I can be a part of that, let's do it. But he's just a great guy. Bro, that's insane. And so how did you lose everything? What happened the first time? Um, like, so I was in back a, when you were like 19. Yeah, I was in a network marketing company and our network market, I was a top earner in a network marketing company. I got out of high school, joined a network marketing company, rose to the top, top earner, um, speaking all over the country at a very early age, you know, in 1920, um, I was just, I mean, we were, we were crushing out or we I have a twin brother, um, but I was the top earner in the company. Um, and, you know, I got married, all that good stuff. And a, a few years down the road, they sold the company and the new company that bought us. Uh, my our compensation plan didn't directly really fit with their compensation plan, so I pretty much lost 
all my income and that's all I was doing. I mean, my, my, ex, my ex-wife now, but my wife at the time, she, she was doing, you know, she had a little side job and was, was doing well, but it, I it was, I just lost everything. But the bad thing about the network marketing company was that they made me act like I was this top rank where I had to like have this lifestyle and everything was awesome. And, and I go your speak. Cash. Yeah. I would go speak and like do all these things, but I'm paying for it. And they want me to do all these things. And I'm like, I'm not making any money. Like, why are you guys wanting me to do this? And so I had to call my buddy and was like, Hey man, like I'm going to lose everything. Like I am a couple of house payments away from losing everything. I only got like five grand in the bank. Like I have to figure something out. And he was like, dude, show up to work tomorrow, whatever you got to do. So I would work from him basically in the, in the morning until evening. I'd go home shower. I would do like zoom meetings all night long. And then I would kiss my wife, the ex-wife, bye, you know, good night. And then I would go work for him through the night and then work, then go to the gym in the morning, take a shower, go back to work for him. And then I was working around the clock just so I could make enough money and bill enough hours that I could have a decent living. Um, but it's just, I ended up taking over all these jobs and building cabinets and installing cabinets and doing running jobs and remodel jobs. And I mean, it was, it was crazy. I remember I had to, I was on a crew. Um, I was building cabinets. We had to build like, uh, we'll build, we were building like entire apartment units. Like it was a entire kitchen and three and a half bath apartment complex. I mean, big apartment yeah. complexes. I had to build 40 of them in like a month and 40 units. So we'd get there and oh, we'd yeah. build everything. I mean, it was crazy. And we uh, got, it's kind of funny because I was running a crew with a couple guys on work release from the jail. So I'd roll up to the jail, everybody'd hop in my truck and we'd drive an hour to the work, work, uh, work site. But that's what you got to do for, for your family. But that was a crazy time. And not a single person in network marketing knew I was doing that because I was hiding it from everybody. Everybody. Do you regret hiding it? You know, that's a great question. That's the first time I've ever been asked that. Um, I don't know. I mean, it, back then, I would have been shunned from the company because how dare you go do something else? And how dare, like it was, and that's the way kind of network marketing is yeah. and was, is, you know, if, if you find out you're doing anything. Like I have a friend of mine who was the master distributor of a company, did over a billion in sales and then he got terminated recently because he wrote a book because they felt like he was doing something else and all he did was write a book. It's kind of really yeah, very interesting. I mean, and I'm not here to down talk anything. I mean, it was very... Network marketing did my family wonders. I mean, my, my mom and dad are probably the largest network marketers in the history of the world. And they, you know, did our family very, very well. But it's definitely changed since then. But it, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, I had to do what I had to do at the time. But I tell you what, I was having a lot of fun. I actually had a lot of fun doing the construction. I almost started to be like, hey, I'd rather do construction than network marketing. But I, I wasn't the best recruiter. I was the best at doing like speaking and like, in training and then also uh, dream building, you know, doing the motivational speaking, but then keeping the team together. And that's where I started to really focus on my culture stuff, um, which is what my podcast is about and yeah. a lot of social media and a lot of my consulting and stuff. But yeah, it's just a crazy time. Well, I think, would you say you're a very, very good operator? Like, would you consider yourself an operator? Cause like you're, the speaking, um, the culture, like it feels like you love being in it. Yeah. And, like, you, would you say you're more of an integrator? Like, are you like in the systems? Like, are you building that out? Because I don't know that much about you that way. Yeah. So I, I get, I'm kind of a freak, man. I get super hyper focused on stuff, and it's a really good thing and bad thing because I'm like a squir- like squirrel, like, and then I'm all in on this one thing for a very short amount of time. Like, like shirts. Like, I'll go buy thirty of one shirt and then love them because you know, like, I'm just, I'm all, I'm just so extreme on stuff. But I love operating and integrating different systems and different things. And I, like right now, I ended up letting go of all our executives and everybody in the in like upper level and just have three general managers. And now I'm just working with those three general managers and really focusing on the processes of the dealerships. I'm having the most fun now being at a dealership every day, talking to everybody every day, dealing with customers every day than I was just being extremely out of the business. And I think the biggest reason is, is because now I'm very confident in what everything we're doing yeah that before i kind of got lot you know just there was not the greatest you know communication and not the greatest things going on but now i'm like hyper focused on just making these dealerships just run and i'm having a blast doing i mean dude i'm even in here coding excel spreadsheets and doing different things i mean like it's i just i get hyper focused on different things and just want to operate but now i understand what the business needs 
on like a 10 X level than yeah. what I even did six months ago. So now it's just my excitement. And like, I'm so hyper-focused at helping us succeed and, and succeeding that like nothing else matters, but it's the craziest thing is like, I'm the happiest when I'm working and the happiest when I'm like in the trenches, I have a really, really hard time disconnecting. And like a lot of people are like, hell, you're going to burn out. I, I no. almost get more burned out and not working. Like I just, I really, really need. And then, you know, when things are probably better, <laughs> you know, and the season's starting and I'm able to, you know, manage things a little bit differently, I'm hoping that I get to go do the fun things or like what I think the fun things are in the dealerships. But right now it's just grinding it out, just making sure that we can survive and just focusing on today. Do you think you had too much bloat in the company when I met oh, you? Yeah. By how oh, much? Yeah. Give me a percentage point. Like too many people? Like, like I uh, think when you say, because it sounds like to me, and because I've done the same thing mm -hmm. on a much smaller scale, I built it on a house of sand and I had too many people doing not enough. Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, dude, we have, I mean, our payroll was almost $2 million a month. Sometimes it was actually more than that. So we had, I mean, we, we were growing the company and scaling the company to where, I mean, we were doing over a hundred million and you just keep pushing and like, we're growing and scaling the company. And generally when you're growing, you're the least profitable because you're having to hire people, get more. Yeah, bro, you got to throw that back in infrastructure. I mean, dude, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm like, we, our IT bill was almost a million seven in two years. I mean, that's another story for another time that I found, I found that out, but like we were just, we we're just, the biggest thing with us is we were growing at a too fast of a pace. And instead of being it because of us, it was really because of the market. So the market was just having us grow and we were just making all this money. And also when the market got soft, we were so top heavy getting ready to grow more dealerships. And then we decided not to buy more dealerships. We're just too top heavy and it started to slide. But the biggest thing was we just weren't paying attention to things we needed to pay attention to, or at least, you know, you know and I was a little bit disconnected. I definitely was not. I, I mean, it's 100 percent on me. I mean, there's self accountability. Right. But I was not paying attention to what I should have been paying attention to. But I thought I had a team executing with excellence and they were not executing with excellence. And so, you know, you, you live and you learn. I'm grateful that it wasn't at the cost of the company because it almost was. Honestly, like you know, there's multiple times where I didn't know if I was going to make payroll or be able to pay a bill or, you know, and still to this day, I mean, we're trying to dig ourselves out of a hole. But, you know, now our season's kind of, we hit the, we hit rock bottom, you know, in the middle of the winter. And now we're kind of working ourselves back up in the next 90 days. It's going to be really pivotal what we do. Um, but it, there's just a lot of things that we just weren't paying attention to. And we had too many people and, we didn't really know the processes and I had people in the company that I thought knew what they were doing. And then come to find out when I went to other dealerships that were kicking ass that my team had no idea what we were doing. Like you go to some of these dealerships and man, it was like a ballet of just beautiful things happening yeah. and like the sales process and this, and I come back to our dealership and I'm like, okay, we're not even in the same game. We're going to ask beat, and this is why. So I came back and implemented a lot of things and, and change a lot of things very, very rapidly. And, you know, some people didn't agree with it because they uh, wanted to be a little bit lazy, but, um, you know, we've gotten kind of got everybody. Now our team is just, we're dialed in and we're, we're rolling as fast as we possibly can. The best example I could use, and I feel like you'll get this Bobby, you know, who Bobby Castro is, mm -hmm. he came and spoke at a, at a mastermind. I'm a part of it. We, it's like a 50 grand a year mastermind. And he came and spoke to us for two hours. And the number one thing that spoke with me was he always says, gain clarity. Mm -hmm. And he's like, you need to fill up your room to the absolute top before you step out of it. Right. Before we go into another room, the shoe boxes need to be to the ceiling. And then we will not leave that room until we can't fit any more shoe boxes. Right. No, that's a great analogy. Because that's what I, I mean, I, I don't know what I don't know. Like, I know a lot of business. Like, I, I watched my dad grow a lot of businesses, but a guy kind of mentioned it this way to me, which actually ended up making sense because it's, it's how I, it's how I manage this business is my dad owned probably 40 companies and they're huge companies, but he always kept his hundred percent mind in network marketing and kind of managed the other ones from like a side a little bit. So that's kind of how I did this business. And then the guy who told was, you know, talking to me and he was like, your dad wasn't a business owner and I wanted to punch him in the face. And he's like, no, no, no. Like a, a business owner is like generally like an operator. Like this is my business. Yeah. I own it. I'm taking ownership of it. He's like, not saying your dad didn't 
like legally own the business, but he was more of an, what we call an, an investor. investor. Yeah. He's just like investing in the business, hope it does good, you know, just kind of has an operator, has a business owner, like has the operator. And I'm like, yep. oh yeah. Like he's like, you totally operated your company like that, which it's, you know, I, I, I don't know. I thought that's what you did. Right. But now thing, like, understanding what it really takes and the things that I should be managing and like the MTMs, the metrics that matter and a handful of metrics in each department per store and what we're measuring in every single day and keeping everybody accountable um, has definitely changed the game for me of what gets measured, gets managed. And if people don't know what they're supposed to do and don't have clear expectations and clear goals and clear, it's extremely hard to operate the business. And so I thought, all this was going on again i was very disconnected and then when i got started interviewing people when i got back from one of my buddies uh locations and they do 700 800 million a year in sales i mean they're huge look and they, well and they don't have very many dealerships so these each individual yeah. store is crushing it and after i got back with him i started to go interviewing my my team and i'm like okay, nothing what I think is going on is going on. Like, and I, and I'm, so I just had to, you know, make some changes and really dive into the business. And, and it's been kind of, uh, it's been like that since probably about August. It's been crazy. Um, so we've, I've looked into buying different companies and the number one thing that, and tell me, is it because you bought and you didn't work in it long enough to like, and like grow it enough to fully understand and hold that person accountable? Yeah, I mean, I, I've never been in a dealer. I've been in like two dealerships in my life. Like I, I, I bought, I think, two cars from a dealership. Like, so I don't even know what they're supposed to look like, right? Like, I don't know what a sales process is. I don't know what the finance team does. I don't know what the general manager is supposed to do. And so it's how do I have all these expectations? And all of a sudden we go build, you know, we go buy a dealership and we thought we were so damn good that we made $17,000 or we made $27,000 the first year in business and made $45,000 the second year in business. And we're like, hell, we're so good at this. We're going to go spend 6 million bucks buying some more stores. And it's like, what the hell? Like, you know, you tell anybody else that that's in the business, they're like, what are you doing? And a lot of people were thinking, what were you doing? And I'm sitting here thinking, well, you guys have been in the business for 20 years and you've only got one store. You're a freaking idiot. Yeah. What are you doing? Yeah. Now I kind of found out of like, well, like it takes a long time to perfect the business, but I didn't know what anything looked like. And yep. so now I'm going to different dealerships being like, Hey, like, how do you greet people when they walk through the door? Like just yeah. breaking it down to the most simple, basic stuff and then writing it down and having, you know, the training and different things on it. It's, it's funny. And I'm sure people are la like going to be like, you're the biggest dumbass. I know. I don't know. Like it's completely different than going and buying a different bit. Like we, like my dad has bought restaurants and been super successful. He did have a guy that ran them, but they had never been in the business before. So one of his business partners just kind of ran it and said, okay, we'll do it. And it's a little bit more simple, but dealerships you have in 2018, Harvard business put out an article that a RV dealership was the hardest business in America to run. And it right. is one of it, 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 it is crazy because you have five, you have basically five different businesses under one roof that have different P and L's, different expenses different department managers that all have to work in like together to create one dealership that is stuck back in 1985. I mean, our industry is an old industry. And so it's like, it's, it's just barbaric. If I would have known how hard it was, I would have never gotten this industry, but it is what it is. Now I just see this opportunity to make it better. What are the five parts, bro? So we got, we you have got, to buy from the people. Well, you got new sales, used sales, finance, parts, and service. They all have their different managers. They all have their different P and L. They all have their different expenses. They all pay rent to to the, it, the everything's different allocations. I mean, it's it's a freaking nightmare. But and they all have to run together, and they're all fighting for each other. No, I want my department to be more profitable. No, I want my more, my department to be more profitable. So they're they're trying to not play nice with each other sometimes. Now our team does really really well, but then it's just. It's just kind of, it's crazy. And then you're dealing with state titling. You're dealing with banks. You're dealing with, yep. you know, flooring lines that I get, how I buy my inventory. You're built, you're dealing with, you know, 30 or 40 banks from the consumers that you're doing the paperwork for the bank, for, you know, for the consumer paper. Like there's so many different things that you're managing. It's, it's crazy. Bro, that's insane. And so 
So I'm guessing they're all fighting for different allocations of resources to make their department better. Yeah. So you got to keep everybody in check. And then you yep. have five. Did you over promote anybody in your uh, before you laid everybody off? I found that is another thing that fucked me is I gave people titles that they did not need. They were over promoted. And then now there's nowhere for them to go. Yep. Yep. For sure. And, and gave people titles that probably should have never really been in that position. But then like one thing with me, you know, you know, there were some people, you know, in the company that kind of felt like a lot of our employees had golden handcuffs. And once we had to make all these changes, you know, me in there and, you know, I'm operating the business and I care. I do care about people. I love culture. But at the end of the day, like we got to make sure we have the right butts in the right seats yeah. and kind of realizing we didn't have the right butts in the right seats, but not being scared to make a change. And I mean, there's a lot of people out there in the world that probably, you know, if you're a business owner, you, you might have one of your own that you, you shouldn't be there, but you just need a body. And I feel like that's like a disease of business owners is like, oh, well, we need it. Or maybe not the best, but we need a body. Well, like if they quit today, trust me, you'd find a way. I mean, business owners, we're resourceful people. Like, you know, we'll figure something out, right? Um, I mean, I've had to go stay in places that I don't want to go stay for an extended period of time. But you find it, you you figure it out. And that's just, you know, business ownership is resourceful people. But realizing like how important the right people are and the right seats and the right bus has been huge for me of just kind of realizing, okay, maybe, you know, there's some people on our team that just, you know, maybe shouldn't, they just don't have the experience. And, you know, we got to get someone there for experience that can run the dealership and, you know, different things like that. So, yeah, I mean, we had quite a few of those people that, we're kind of lingering around and hanging out and it sucks because it's 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 not their fault it's just it's our fault you know, yeah it's yeah it's our fault for not training them and you know i'm the hell am i supposed to train you on like i don't know what i'm but i don't know what i'm doing either like i you know I, that's why i have to get really good general managers that have been in the business for a long time they even teach me with some stuff yeah so how would you say your hiring process has changed now or will change now compared to before after this experience because i at a point bro I feel like everybody has to hire on more experienced people than them so they can keep getting to the next level. 100%. And really right now, so biggest thing for me is grooming people to ever always go up and really, really dialing in, like kind of figuring out who can run the dealerships and or their departments, whatever. So there's always kind of a, a path up. I do want to eventually grow into different aspects and areas of the RV business and maybe some more dealerships, but maybe some other things. Um, so like seeing who could be a regional or, where we could pick and move people and like kind of training them for that. But a big thing is just, I mean, maybe I'm not even allowed to say this, but like recruiting, I, if people are looking for jobs, there's a reason. And for some reason I've always gotten the people that are looking for jobs that haven't had work for a long time to make up this big old long story of why they're the best in the world, but they don't have a job and they come and they just suck for us. So now I've kind of got, I've gotten dialed in and going to like industry networking events, even in the car business, like automotive and, and asking yeah. people are happy or asking people, you know, recruiting. And I'm trying to get a lot of car business people into our industry because they have it dialed in. I mean, some of these car manuf- car uh, dealership um, owners, oh man, they got things dialed in. And in the RV business, we're just so far behind the times because it's a lot of older owners that yep, a little bit more redneck, I'm not going to lie, than normal. And just it's just a very different culture in the RV industry versus car. But the consumer's expectation is car, right? Of how dialed. And, and that doesn't mean like, you know, everybody's wearing a three-piece suit. I mean, I, I dress up because I want to, but not everybody's wearing a three-piece suit and different things like that in the RV business. But it's better customer service being more organized. Because oh, yeah. The, 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 the least of, you know, if you have better communication, because the actual expectation, like you go into a car dealership now, dude, they're freaking selfie in your damn car. Like, look at your brakes and look at your tire tread and oh, I did this. And they're doing a walkthrough underneath your car with the phone. Well, th- like, no one in the RV business is doing that, but like, that's the expectation the level of service. So, like, I'm, I'm trying to bring that new vibe to the RV industry. Uh, which I got a lot of pushback, but our, our location, I mean, that's our whole goal is to change the RV industry. I can't change the dealers or the, the manufacturers and trailers and all that stuff, but I can change customer service. Yeah. And it's a lost art. And so that's our whole goal as a, as a group is to dial in our customer service, dial in the communication, dial in our processes so we can add value to the customer. Our, our like internal saying is, does it add value to the customer? 
If I it doesn't it. add value to the customer, then why are we going to do it? Because it, we're just all about adding value to the customer and making it easier for the customer because we really do care about the memories that are created in the RV business. That is one thing 100%. different from other dealerships is it is a memory creator. It's a therapy, right? Going to the mountains with no cell service, just you and your RV or you and your family or you and your friends, whatever. We do really take that serious. And, and some people kind of laugh at me when I say that. And I'm like, I care so much about the memories that people are going to create that I almost take, like, I'm a, I almost like feel bad. And it's a disservice to the c customer if we failed in our part to not sell them an RV yep. because we're taking memories away from them. 100%. And I mean, bro, me and Kalani went on a 45 day RV trip this summer. So we wow. took a, we took a fifth wheel from Salt Lake all the way up to Portland, and wow. we went and saw like some of our real estate and like camped in national parks and stuff. But it yeah. was we'll remember that forever. Oh yeah, you know what yeah, I'm saying? Such like a unique, such a unique like trip, right? I mean, it, I mean, you would never be able to recreate that doing anything else. I mean, you can maybe get in a road trip and go from hotel to hotel to hotel, but when you're out in nature, there's just something. I mean, there's all kinds of like. I guess studies coming like uh, Gary Brecka um, from yeah. 10X. Like I've, I've actually been connected with him a little bit. I mean, he's talking about like, you will see on the social media about grounding and going out and stepping, you know, foot on the ground and how it like does something to the ions in your body and, you know, all this stuff. Yeah. There is just something about going on an RV trip, like out Up into there. nature, into the wilderness, with family yeah. that is completely different than if you're still to go on a resort and put your feet in the sand, right? Like it's just, it's a completely yeah. different vibe. It's a completely different vacation. And I, I mean, I love it. Like, I don't know how, you know, there's just nothing else out there that I think even comes close to an RV vacation. Bro, have you read Unreasonable Hospitality yet? Mm -mm. I promise you, it is the best book on customer service ever. Unreasonable Hospitality. I will Text me your address and I'll send it to you. Okay. I promise you it's going to change your life. Like it's this guy went from not being on the best restaurants in the world to being the number one restaurant in the world. Really? All through like customer service, creating great moments for his customers. Like you're, you're going to eat it up, bro. It's the oh, best yeah. book I've ever read on customer service. No, I love that because it's it, like, it's free, you know, how you treat someone and the vibe and how, how you're excited when they come in and you know, like, the worst thing that I hate is when I go to say the Home Depot and I'm like, Hey, where is this? And they're like, Oh, it's you know, aisle over there. Blah, blah, blah. You know, maybe it's this. And I'm like, okay. But there's been a, a handful of times and I'm like, Oh, come with me. How's your day going? What are you doing today? What do you, what, why do you need this fastener? Why do you need this bolt? Why do you need this? What project you got going on? Oh, Hey, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And, but soon they're upselling me and they probably don't even know it, but it, that's good customer service. It's like, Oh, I didn't think that I, the last thing I want to do is freaking come back here. So just give me everything that I need that I think that, that you might think I need and then let me, you know, once and then I'm gone, dude. And they come and show me, you know, the part or they show me what I need. And so that's the vibe that we're trying to bring to our dealerships is our salespeople are really the customer service representatives. Yep. No matter what, parts, sales or service, they are coming to the customer, asking them what they need and then walking them back to service, walking them over to parts, walking them over to, you know, if it's sales, like... We are there to help the customer have the greatest experience in the RV industry. And it's not like that at Camper World, I know, because I was in there all the fucking time on that yep. RV trip having to buy parts. Yep. Right? And I got to walk in there. I got to go find a bunch of shit to where if you have a greeter, hey, we're right here. Like it, right. it really will be a completely different experience because I had to go to all sorts of RV parts stores, Camper World to get different stuff where the trailer would ever break down. Right. And that's, you're very, very right about that. Right. But what would you say some of your, you love culture. What are some of your keys to building culture in your company? Oh, one of the biggest things is, is just is care and love your people. But the biggest thing to culture is your culture is the process and your process is the culture. And that's one thing that I've learned from even the beginning of like me going and speaking in the beginning of, you know, me talking about culture is really like it's one this one mentor of mine, you know, I was talking to him about culture and, and, and he came in and he's like, man, I was listening to your podcast. I was like, what's up, dude? And he was like, I got to I got to tell you, man, I disagree. We got to talk about this. And I was like, what's up? And he was like, when you talk, you know, the culture is a feeling and it's hard to explain. He's like, that is a cancer to your company. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And this dude has had mega dealerships like this guy. He was in the car business and he's probably uh -huh. one of the top five car business operators in the country. Oh, wow. Like, this guy is world. Yeah, he's throwing he's, down. He's, he's a. He's like, let me talk, tell you about this. So he's like, you know, sit down. Let's talk about this. 
But he's like, your processes should be so defined that your process is the culture. And I'm like, okay, let's talk about it. And he was like, from your greeting, wouldn't you say your greeting and the whole culture and the vibe, like, you know, when you're talking to someone is the culture. And I'm like, yeah, it's that feeling you give. He's like, you need to define the feeling. What is the point of your people trying? What, what is the point of that? Are you trying to make the customer feel warm? Are you trying to make them feel like you define that in your processes? And I was like, oh, crap. Like, damn. I think you're right. And so then I started going in and, you know, interviewing my employees and I'm like, what is the culture? They're like, uh, mm, you know, it's the feeling. And like, you're, you know, I'm like, okay, it's so much more than personalities. It's so much more than manager styles. It's so much more. It's, it's defining the processes to a T on how you're going to operate your business and what your people are going to, how they're going to act. Case in point, Chick-fil-A, what do they say? My pleasure. You'll never forget that. Never forget that. That is written down. 100% written down. Like, that, it's not just the feeling, right? That is 100% written down material that they have to read and memorize and sign and all that stuff. But they will say, my pleasure. They'll be happy. They'll smile. You know, they'll be clean cut. They'll sure will be tucked in. All that is culture, but it's all clearly defined. And so if your process is so defined and so clear that, you know, that, it, that it's just like, it's, it's just, it's so ingrained in people. That's yes. Culture. That, I mean, it's where it's just so like, even pe- I used to hire people working at, uh, you know, when I used to work at Hollister, um, but I, we would, uh, we would recruit people from Chick-fil-A because, you know, they good employees, right? Like, but, that, but that's the culture. That's what they create because they define like a regiment so regimented that it just creates amazing employees, like amazing people. So we would go recruit from Chick-fil-A and every time anybody said, thank you, like my pleasure. I'm like, you work at Chick-fil-A. Like, you know, like, cause I know that, it, that uh, that is amazing that they can almost coin and like trademark a term where yeah. they could be working at a gas station and you could say, Hey, thank you. And they say, my pleasure. I'm like, did you work at Chick-fil-A? And they're like, yep. I'm like, yep. I knew it. Like that's, that's, that is culture. Bro, that I've done a lot of interviews and I think that one's one of the most like powerful takeaways I've had. Cause I'm a little bit like, I don't think about how does that person feel in that process? Right. Like, Damn. Yeah. Well, and- it's, it's, it's t- sorry, I mean, inter- interrupt. Like it's, it's hard. You know, I used to go in and speak a lot and do all these things. And like, it's just, but then, but really defining the culture and defining the expectations and then, and holding people accountable. And like, you create a goal, a plan. But the biggest thing is that GP of that GPA is the accountability. And if you can't hold someone accountable, then you really should never make the goal or the plan. The accountability is really the most important part. But when you're talking about culture, you create the goal of the good culture, you create a plan, but how are you going to hold people accountable? And what are you going to do? You know, when you can walk into your place of business and they don't have, say, say something, how are you going to hold it? Like, it's just, everything should be so rinse and repeat that that's the culture and that's who they are. And it almost turns it into like a, the best way I could put it is meticulous. Mm-hmm. And then meticulous becomes a part of your culture. Cause if right. anything is meticulous, it is operating well. Right. And it's no just it's like a well oiled machine. And your processes shouldn't, you shouldn't process everything to death where it slows it down. The process should streamline it. You'd be meticulous with it. And it should put like, you know, rocket fuel behind it. It should increase it because everybody's just like, boom, 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 boom. This is what I do. And it's clearly defined. It is the culture. It's the expectations. It's what everybody's supposed to do. And it should be so like simple that you can take anybody off the street and start training them on what they're supposed to do. And they're good to go that you don't, I mean, and that's really what we want to do is systemizing things is then you bring in a system. Part of it is, is, is now you systemize it where now you can kind of get anybody to, to get into your system and it makes them an elite person. Bro, are you a part of any masterminds right now? Um, I am not. Well, I'm a, I'm a part of an ex mastermind here in Utah. How, what's your biggest takeaway from that one? Um, that one's mostly just networking. Um, I know I've known everybody in it for a really, really long time, but it's just the power of, of networking and like, you know, getting people together and talking about problems, but like real raw problems. Like we're all like the market's the market right now. Right. But yeah, a lot of people are kind of hiding behind. Oh, it's perfect for me. It's amazing. This, you know, whatever. You don't got to share everything on social media. I'm not going to say that, but getting, uh, getting in a group of people that are actual there to help you for the right reasons, not for Instagram posts, not for that. I mean, the X mastermind isn't even really on social media. I mean, it's just, we get together every month and you have a big lunch at someone's company, someone's business kind of hosts it. And we just kind of get together, talk, talk about real raw business. And we it, like, that's 
the real like that's masturbating right like that's the real shit instead of being like oh yeah like everything's perfect and like no like that's not that's not real shit like we're talking about we got employees we got problems we got vendors we have businesses we have real estate we have this we have that like we need help with a certain thing that's that's what the x does for you bro so when shit started to hit the fan and do you want to talk i do you want to talk numbers about how much inventory you're sitting on and how much of a stroke that was every month Oh, it was crazy. So when everything started to go south and shit started hitting crazy fan, it was almost, I mean, so in the, in the business, we have to pay what we call curtailments. Curtailments are a principle. So I get all of my inventory. It's called flooring. So all my inventory is basically on a line of credit from the bank. So at one time, I, I mean, right now I have $59 million credit line. Like right now I only have 17 million in inventory. So we're probably going to peel back that credit line a little bit. So um, I don't have yeah. to pay interest on the whole credit line, just whatever I'm using. Okay. But at one time last year, I had 59 million in inventory, basically. And the interest rate just shot up from 3, 3.25%, 3.24% past 10. So that happened like that. I mean, I, I gauged that the, the interest rate would go to about 5.5%. I was an idiot. I, I, got, I made their 50%. Like, so I gauged like, all my budgets on 5.5%. Like we were trying to be very conservative. And we thought sales were going to be kind of a little bit down, but we didn't think they were going to be down as drastic as they were. I mean, some of the the markets are down 50, 60 percent, which is that's no one gauges for a 50 or 60 no, percent it's like decrease. It's dead. Yeah, yeah, it's dead at that point. And so when the market shoots up or, or the, the interest rates shoot up, the market shoots down, you have, you know, and then all my all of a sudden started an inflation started going like crazy. So all my expenses are going up. And then now these manufacturers are starting to come out with, with new, uh, new year. So now I have old inventory that I'm having to basically offload on just my 2022 models. We lost about one and a half million dollars in Utah and, you know, at a negative gross profit that we had to basically give them away. But the biggest thing was, is when we had that, you know, that 50 million in inventory and you're paying 10% interest. I mean, that, that shit gets crazy. Oh, wow. But the biggest thing was those curtailments and those curtailments hit in February. And my brother comes to me and he says, Hey, Jay, what, what is a lot of curtailments? Like, what is that number? You know, like, is it, you know, 500,000? I'm like, how much are, what's the curtailment bill? And again, that's the principal payment on top of the interest. Because they start, when units start to age, we have to pay the principal down. Okay. That payment was $900,000 on February 20th. And he told me that on like February 10th. And I'm like, dude, what the, like, you know, between our interests and our curtailments, you're talking about 1.2, $1.3 million dollars plus our 2 million in payroll, plus everything else. I mean, our nut to crack was over $5 million that, I mean, and all this, it was just freaking like Chernobyl. I'm like, dude, we're not going to make, like, what the hell are we going to do? And then we started selling them at a negative gross profit. So not only are we selling at a negative gross profit, we got all these expenses just going crazy. And that 800,000 turns into like 950 in March, 1.2 in April, because it starts to increase every single month. So what we had to do is flush the toilet instead of burning through millions and millions and millions of dollars in cash. When we paid that $900,000 off, that's our new ceiling. So we would just sell everything below that just to stop the hemorrhaging. So we just were selling like crazy, just cheap, just flushing the toilet of all the old age inventory. And we lost millions and millions of dollars. It was, and then still paying the interest, right? So then we had to sell our Missouri stores and then we had to sell our Oregon stores to really stop the hemorrhaging. I mean, that was really the biggest reasons why we sold the stores. So the people who bought them, did you list them with a business broker or you just call the people you knew like, hey, bro, I need to sell this thing? So I got a buddy who's a big broker in the industry that is one of the biggest broker. He is the biggest broker in the industry um, who sold them for us. Jesus. And so yeah. the, do, you, do you know who the buyers were? Oh, yeah. One of them in Missouri has become like one of my best friends. I mean, he's awesome. Great guy. What uh, was his plan with it? Is he like, oh, no, I know what I'm doing. It'll be fine. Oh, yeah. He's like, dude. He, I mean, but he's got 19 years on me in the business. Oh, you know, like, yeah. He's like laughing at me. And he was like, you've been in the business five years and you bought nine locations. And I'm like, yeah. And he was like, it took me 10 years to figure out how to make money in this industry. You're an idiot. And I'm like. Well, you're getting okay. after it, you know. Yeah. yeah. Or you're I mean, getting after it. Yeah. And he's like, you know, so he, he's the one that actually was like, I mean, he, he cared so much about me and he's like, did I really want to help you? Like, I don't want to see you go out. And like, I'm like, dude, I don't know what I'm doing because I know business, but how am I supposed to operate a dealership? So he flew his jet out here. 
went to all of our locations and then he's like what are you doing this weekend and i'm like kicking it man what's up and he was like come to florida with me you know come back to come back home so i hopped in his jet went home uh went in the middle of the flight we diverted over to texas to go check out one of his dealerships in texas and then flew that flew to florida that night and then i got to go hang out with him in his different locations in for his main location in florida and just watch how they operated watch how the gm actually operated the business and i'm like oh that's what you're supposed to do like ah, now you know all these people are telling me these theories but now i'm actually seeing it yeah you know happen in person and that's how i learn is watching things happen in person is, is just so much easier for me and so really that that was a like a life-changing moment for me is, is really getting a mentor that actually knows what they're doing and he's a badass i mean he's only 36 or 37 years old i can't remember but he's a badass i mean the dude's a beast he, he really understands the business and, and how to make money in this industry and he's smart like he he hoarded cash and wasn't an idiot with stuff i mean pretty much got a lot of his locations for free because of the the market right and just did good things and you know he's helped me a ton the guys who bought oregon um are a company out of california and they're a pretty big company about 300 million a year um so and they 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 seem to have things dialed in i'm not as close with them um but this guy down in florida i'm we become really good buddies. We talk a lot, bro. That guy in Florida, I got emotional because I feel like that is like the biggest blessing ever. Oh, it 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 saved me. I mean, I, I've had consultants come in and do this and do that, but once I went and saw what you know you're supposed to do is incredible, and it's crazy because you know I spoke at a at a conference here in Utah with a guy named Aaron William Aaron Williamson. Well, Aaron Williamson is like the Rocks trainer, Zac Efron's trainer. Like he's this big celebrity trainer. And me and him were in the back room talking about culture. And he's like, hey, like, I'd really like you to come down. And, you know, you know, now he's partners with Andy Elliott, the, the Elliott Group in sales training. He's, okay. like, hey, he's like, I'd really like you to come down with me, me and Andy and talk about culture and talk about all this stuff. I'm like, oh, yeah, that'd be awesome. Well, that was my mindset. I, me and Andy have a lot of mutual friends, but never really had any interest of, you know, I didn't. I didn't think I needed sales advice because we were killing it. Well, again, that was market driven. That was not Jason. That was not anything to do with what we were doing. That was, yeah. that was COVID. I mean, bad thing for a lot of people, but it was really good for us. And so it's funny because Denver, this guy was like, probably should, maybe shouldn't say his name. I don't know. But this guy from Florida um, was like, uh, you really need to go like study Grant Cardone or Andy Elliott and really learn how your sales process because you end. don't understand that. So it's crazy. So on the plane, I get delayed for six hours. I'm watching all these Andy Elliott videos because I've already seen all grants, but I really like Andy. And then I'm not even kidding. I come back on Monday, start implementing all this stuff. Now, and then on Wednesday, I get invited. One, one of my really good friends, his name's Keaton Hoskins. He says, hey, man, you want to come to dinner? And I was like, yeah, I'll come to dinner. And so I go up to his house for dinner and freaking Andy Elliott's there. And I'm like, holy shit, man. Like I was didn't know that I needed you, but I need you now. And so me and him connected um now he's he's like we're like he's like a brother to me i mean we're we're talking he, i mean he's done so much for our company so hiring him and the in the elliot group to be able to come do sales training for us and really teach us how to sell oh, yeah and then these mentors that are really and then through andy i got him in a mentor this mentor that has all these dealerships it's like that that top five guy that i was talking about earlier Andy hit him up and he was like hey man i can help jason with sales but i can't help him with all this other stuff you need to go help him you need to go to Utah. So this guy showed up in Utah, started helping me. So now I got Andy, I got this guy really dialing in our processes, helping me um, kick ass and that, but that's the power of networking and, and, and getting around people that are smarter than you. But at the same time, they wouldn't have helped you if you weren't a good person. Right. It's true. And, and I had to be open to it, right? Like if, yeah. if, it, if it would have been a week earlier, I wouldn't have cared about it. I would have been trying to pitch him on why I should come speak to their company about culture. Yep. And talk about culture. I mean, Andy's probably got one of the best cultures I've ever seen. It's a cult. But like, yeah. But it's just, timing's everything, man. Like, everything happens for a reason. And it's the crazy, like, I literally called that guy from Florida, and I'm like, you're never going to freaking believe this. I'm sitting here with Andy Elliott. And he was like, no way. And I'm like, I'm, take a picture, man, smile. That got me. He's like, what the heck, dude? That's crazy. We're just talking about him. And I'm like, I, I had never watched a single Andy Elliott video up until then. Bro, that's insane. Oh, back yeah. to the bank part, dude. Did they just not warn you? Like in your paperwork, they said they could just jack your line of credit to whatever point they wanted to. They didn't care. No, nope, they 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 can do different rates. Um, the thing that hurt or not hurt us a little bit, but they changed from LIBOR to SOFR, which is a little bit more variable, a little bit more up and down. Um, when LIBOR went away, what a year ago, and so it just, dude, it's just 
the banks really hold everybody by the balls with this industry. I mean, there's, there's just, you work for the banks. I mean, and that's what makes a lot of people turned off from our industry. Yeah. You just, you work for the banks. Does anybody have enough cash to say, fuck the banks? Like we're just going to do it internal. There are a handful of companies that had that for all their own inventory. So that's all cash. So they just, you know, they have a billion dollars in, in inventory sitting there and it's, they own it. I see. Like- that's the, that's the measuring. Like, that's what I want to be. You know, instead of the guy that's like, oh, I got like 15 dealerships and I'm leveraged up my ass. I want to be like, exactly. the guy that's like, I have three locations. I do a hundred million in sales and I own all my shit. Like that's the bigger, big, like that's the bad dog of it to me. When two years ago, I'd have been like, you're an idiot. You only have three locations. But I mean, cause like you got to have some type of risk mitigation, just like in real estate. I know some dudes who only, they have like 70% of their real estate paid off and they just won't. They will not put on any more debt on it just because they just want to sleep good at night. Right. And Especially right of, now. Yeah. Like when the interest rate, you know, three years ago was like a negative interest rate. I don't even know how that happens. <laughs> when it was a negative interest rate. Yeah. Okay. Leverage the shit out of stuff. But a lot of time, well, what's going on right now is a lot of those are five year. You know, if it's an SBA, it's a five year call. Dude, yep. we're at the five year mark. Right. I mean, people aren't going to be able to refinance their stuff, but it's, it's, you know, but that's us kind of not knowing and being like, okay, like we didn't manage our cash very well, pay down things we should have and put yeah. the money back in the business. We went and bought other things that lost money like me. So talk about how you wish you would have bought more things instead of more dealerships. Oh man. I wish I would have went and bought more jets. Um, well, maybe not. Cause we lost a little bit of money cause we bought them at the peak. Um, and jets were kind of hard to sell here for a little bit, but I wish I would have, uh, you know, I have a, slew of lambos and rolls royces and property and houses and this and that like i wish i would have wouldn't put all that money in those um what i thought i was doing was smart investing and again you don't know what you don't know but we put it in all we put a lot of that money or pretty much all that money back into dealerships that cost a lot of money to buy cost a lot of money to influx you know your 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 you know first capital yeah. to be able to run the business and then they ended up losing money put more money back in and losing money put more money into them then we decided to sell them and then it costs money to sell them. And so, I mean, we lost millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars um, through all of that. If I would have went and bought a 40 Lamborghinis and they lost 50% value, I would have only lost 50% value. I would have gone down to zero plus some. <laughs> so you live and you learn, but it is what it is. Oh my God. I had another but so what is your overall goal, bro? Are you still trying to beat Camper World? Because I remember when I was talking to you, you're like, bro, I'm going for it. I'm trying to fuck Camper World. I'm doing it. I'm going for a Billy where you're really going to do this. The biggest thing for me now is I don't want to be the biggest. I just want to be the best. And I want to get a company that is just clipping along. You know, if I get it to 60 million between, I, I mean, we'll do 60, you know, 60 million will be safe this year here in Utah. I know that I can get it to 100, but to say that this year I'm going to get to 100 is kind of a stretch because of everything going on, election year, and the the, the, the rate is still a little bit high. And people, yeah. when they don't really know what's going on with the elections, I'm buying habits will stay a little more stagnant. I just want to perfect the processes. I want to get to a net percentage that is that is honorable net percentage and get things so dialed in where we create that system. I want to be the Chick Fil A of the the RV business. I, I don't want to necessarily have an RV, you know, a restaurant on every corner, RV dealership on every corner. I want to be the best, and I want to be a household brand in Utah. I want to be the best brand in Utah. I want to be the go to brand in Utah. I want to I want to build this company to be all over. I want billboard. Like I want everybody to know who Haugen RV is. And I want to build the best bra. I just want to have the best. This is perfection. The deal now perfection is not the expectation because that's impossible. But I just want to dial in everything super well, get my net profit where it should be. And then if I ever want to grow, maybe it's in a different industry. Like I was talking to Alex Hamosi one time and he was like, what are you going to do? You know, what was this? What is that? Like, you know, tell me your story. And I'm like, man, I might do this and I might do that. And he was like, you're an idiot. Like the worst thing that you can do is all of a sudden you have this RV business and all of a sudden you take a right hand or left hand and you're into, you know, you have an ice cream shop and then you have this and you have that. He's like, it's just focus on the RV business and see how you, it will see where the needs are in the RV business and then and see then how you can help. fill them in yeah. other areas, whether maybe it's an RV park or RV storage and all that fill the cup up and it overflows into other cups, but it's just from the same water. And I'm like, oh man, that makes total sense. So creating this big brand in Utah is really my my goal. What were your other takeaways from hanging out with Hormozy? 
Oh, dude, he's a beast, man. He's just he's nuts. So smart. He thinks of things so differently. And he only I actually have a cell phone number, but I never really hit I've never I've texted him a couple times, but it was really just that one conversation at Top Golf, and we were just kind of talking. And I mean, he's just super cool. I mean, him and Layla were awesome to, to chat with and just like dialing in processes and not getting so like stretched so thin of where you're now things start to fail has been a big thing that he, you know, told me and it's, it's really stuck with me. Uh, what type of margin are you trying to go for in all reality? Cause we have one company that'll do like a 90% margin, but it's at seven figures and it will not last long. You know what I'm saying? Cause people right. have really, really bad expectations and businesses of being able to, bro, we're, not everybody's a SaaS company. Right. Right. Yeah. SaaS is insane. Um, but really, like in the RV industry, um, if you're net the sales, um, you know, your EBITDA, which we really don't do EBITDA in the RV industry because we don't add back our interest. Um, you know, if you're that 7 to 10%, it's pretty strong. I mean, car business is like 2 to 4%. I mean, really? It's really, really low. Oh, yeah. Car business, you don't make a lot of money in the car business. Um, but if we, if we can get to that 7 to 10%, I know dealerships are at 14%, and those people are like gods to me. Um, I, I have an opportunity to go hang out with a couple of those guys and they're going to teach me some things because I don't know how they do it, but really get into that. Like the 10% is a, a great goal. I mean, then, then you're not, you know, if you're making like in our business, we call a safety net, like 3% net. That's basically like you're going out of business. <laughs> yeah. 3% net. Yeah. I'm making money, but it's a rounding error. Like if you mess up in one way, super fast and there goes all your money. So in the RV business, it's, it's crazy because you could make $10 million in a year on your net, on your bottom line, on your net profit, but you got to pay taxes on it because you can't do anything to freaking mitigate your taxes in, in this industry because the bank will look at you like you don't like the bank doesn't do ad backs. The bank doesn't look at anything. They look at your net. And if you're, it's not a strong net, it's, it's not a good situation. So, so you're just fucked. You could go buy some stuff to appreciate it down, but then the bank will look at you like no bitch. Like, right. Unless it stays in the company. So they, yeah. they, they really want it to stay in the company. And so say you made 10 million bucks. That sounds great. If I had told people, I made $10 million this year, they'd be like, oh my gosh, like you're amazing. Well, let's break it down here. You got to pay taxes on it because I can't do any tax mitigation. So you're at, you know, say you're walking away with five and a half to $6 million. But with, you know, okay, now that's like, you know, that's the money left over. But if I have 5 million in used inventory or 6 million in used inventory that I have, I have no money. Yeah. It's all sitting there in assets, right? I can't go buy lunch with it. It's freaking the craziest thing in the world. So I oh. used to not think that you, dude, in our, in our, you know, it's so cash intensive that, you know, I get these friends that are in real estate and they're like, you know, oh, hey, like I just flipped a house and made 400 grand. And I'm like, or 200 grand or 100 grand. I'm like, you get to go buy lunch with the money? They're like, oh, yeah. I'm like, man, <laughs> dude, we can make $10 million in a year and I can't go buy lunch with it. I got to wait until everything's cleared and like, you know, make sure that we have enough money to to run the cash, you know, because it's such a cash intensive business. It's just it's a barbaric industry. When do you start buying new inventory? Like for the uh, next year when the 2025 comes out, because I'm that buyer who says I don't want the 2024 anymore. Fuck right. that. I want the 2025. The 25s will come out. Well, and this is the thing is there's no regulation for our industry. They could come out in February. I mean, it's whatever the manufacturer decides. It's not like the car business where they start coming out in September. It's whatever the manufacturer decides. What? And oh, dude, it's stupid because so if I get caught with all these twenty fours, you're and, fucked, and bro. Because yeah. it depreciates down how much when those come out? Oh, a lot. I mean, you're having to take big. And the problem right now is because the prices are decreasing. So for me to match the next model year price, I have to discount my twenty threes. So that now that's where we're at right now is the twenty fours that are coming out or have come out then we're having to discount prices because they've decreased the prices. The manufacturer decreased the prices. So I'm like, I mean, it's just barbaric. So we got to get, we got to get in this cycle. We're, we're behind. Where, and so now you got to catch up, get on the cycle. Catch up and get the cycle where, where now we're managing the inventory when the 25s come out that we're in a better position. Oh my God. Yeah. And there's no like group of RV dealership owners that want to go to the manufacturers back. Hey, we ain't doing this shit no more. Well, we all want to, but for some reason, they just come out with stupid stuff. So, so they'll start transferring over probably May or June. And then most of them will try to tr start transferring over 
September ish, August September ish. But you are pumping to get this bit all that shit out. Assume. Yeah. Oh, you have to. Now you're starting to take, you know, losses on stuff just to make sure that you don't have it before the new stuff comes out. And a lot of people that like this industry is going to be in a crazy situation because a lot of my friends that are dealers and a lot of other dealerships out there have 2022s and a lot of them. And now they're going to be three years old. Right. And the bank, the bank looks at them like when I'm going, you know, if I'm using Bank of America to buy, you know, if I'm a consumer and I'm buying, the bank will look at that like a used unit and they'll look at it like it's three years old. It, it's going to be crazy. And bro, why do I see massive cuts whenever I'm like looking at stuff with RVs? They're like MSRP 50 grand, but you can get it for 20. It's like, huh? How? The MSRP like- in, in the RV industry is kind of a, is an interesting number. It's not like the car business where the MSRP and you get a thousand bucks off and you're getting a deal. It's the RV industry is just a little bit different. And, and I don't have a reason, an answer why. It's just, it it doesn't really make a lot of sense. The MSRP is just the MSRP. Are, how much of inventory are you buying at a time? Like, do you have to buy at a time to get a good rate so that way you can bake in your margins in the future and like all that stuff? Um, it just It just matters by manufacturer. A lot of them don't give discount rates and some of them do. Right now, they're really trying to get us to buy inventory because they're stocked and, you know, they have a lot of inventory back in Indiana where they're all made. And so they're giving us a lot of good deals right now. Um, we try not to project too far ahead so then we don't get stuck in a position where we have too much inventory. So we're really at like a 90-day projection of what's going to happen in 90 days. And we're always looking maybe like 90 to 120 days out. Because remember, in June is my peak generally yeah well last two years it's been in march so i'm really hoping it's in june because march doesn't make any sense to me why the last two years have been my biggest biggest month but in june it historically is like a nice little bell curve in june and it comes back down in june i basically won't order anymore i'll maybe order onesies and twosies but i'm trying to sell down the inventory for the winter so i'm not paying interest on inventory that's just going to sit there so we are our season is super short here, yeah. here in Utah. What is it? Yeah, especially in Utah. Yeah. What's your, in an RV dealership, what is the most profitable department and what should be like, okay, this is our cash cow. This carries us through those down seasons. So I'm guessing it's like service carries the off season or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Your finance department where you're selling your service contracts, your gap and stuff, that's the big, you know, that's where a lot of people make a lot of their money. Um, in RV industry, sales still, still makes good margins in normal years. Um, but that service department is going to bring you through the winter, but you know, RV industry is, is hard on, is really, really hard in service. So not like the car business, but we, uh, we, we try to have that carry us and, and it never really slows down, um, for us in service, but the most profitable would be the finance department. All right. I got a couple more questions. I don't want to take up too much of your time, bro. Thank you. Oh, again. You're good. You're good. Um, do you want to buy again? Like when the time comes, are you going to be that guy who comes and picks on you? I'd list the next guy. I was like, but I'm going to get a deal on this, but I'll help you. So it doesn't happen again. Right. I do want to buy again. I think that I'm going to be way more picky of what my buy box is going to be though. Instead of just a good deal. I would really prefer to be in the state of Utah or within driving distance. So you made your Idaho, your Southern Idaho, Colorado, maybe Colorado. Like I wouldn't mind that. Like it's a very similar market to Utah. I've learned that Missouri and Oregon were completely different markets, and I don't know anything about them. <laughs> so we didn't do super yeah. well because they're just very, very different. Now, they're good markets in themselves, but we just didn't do real well there. So I do want to buy again, but I'll just be way more picky about what we do. Well, I mean, culturally, I feel like it's different. Geographically, it's different. Does it even snow in Missouri? Uh, a little bit. They have, like, these ice storms that just, like, crazy same in Oregon. I I think you're a really good dad. Talk about um, co-parenting on whatever you'd like to share and how you've managed that because I think that is one thing. Me and you have like the same relationship with our exes. Right. That's another thing I really respect about you and how important it's been to raise your daughter in a very good environment. Yeah, I mean it's I mean as you know, it's like co-parenting, having a good relationship with your exes is, is very rare, but I think it's extremely important. 
Um, I mean, my ex-wife and her husband are like the greatest people in the world. Like I absolutely love my ex-wife. Her husband's the greatest guy. Like I, they're like our go-to double date. We go to dinner with them all the time. We're at their house all the time. I mean, we're, we're always doing stuff together, which is just the best situation for my daughter, our daughter. Um, you know, I always call her stepdad, her other dad, because he's, you know, Hey, my expectation is you treat her like a daughter. Exactly. You know, I don't want to take that away because I'm not going to take that away from my daughter. Right. Like I'm not going to take, like if she calls him dad and like, people look at me i don't care like like that doesn't mean like I don't, I don't know i just i think that like but you're an actively trying to be a good father too so you're not yeah. insecure about it no hey i'm and hey he is the calmest most collected human being i know i wish i was like him because i'll be fighting people we'll be skiing together people will cut her off and be like, i want to fight you he's like hey man it's okay just be just chill i'm like man i wish i was like you so I kind of want to be like him and he's a good golfer. Like he's just a good, good, really good guy, but I'm confident in what I have yeah. too. Like, I'm not worried about that. And, you know, I have a great relationship with my daughter and love her to death. And, you know, I'm, I'm uh, actually really happy to sell these locations outside of the state because I'm happy to not have to travel as much as I was and only having her, you know, every, you know, once every Thursday to Friday and then every other Thursday to Monday, when I miss those Thursday to Fridays, I don't see her for 10 days and it kind of sucks. Yeah. So, um, now I'm not going to be traveling as much and always home and I can bring them to, to places that I go now. Um, but it, you know, being that, being there for her, I uh, mean, is so important to me and re- like, you know, we, we got divorced for a reason. I was not the greatest person and I was traveling a lot and didn't really pay attention to her and wasn't giving her what she needed. You know, I thought I was giving her money and she like did, you know, my ex-wife did not care about money. She just wanted me. Not her love language. Yeah. And so which gave me the opportunity to be even better to my now wife. But, you know, I don't want to be, now I'm like very hypersensitive to just the situation. And my family means everything to me, like everything to me. And, you know, my ex-wife, her husband, like even their kids, like their kids are like my kids. Like, like, you know, she probably won't like that, but like, I I view everybody as like, that's my family, right? Like, like, don't mess with my family. And even our employees, like our biggest thing is like family. It was one of our values is family. And it just means the world to me. So it's, it's living, it's, it's intentional. Like, like, you know, like it's an intentional relationship that you have with your ex to be the back. Like, I've never been back to court. We never fight. We never argue. Like it's the easiest. Like I have 99 problems, but my ex-wife is not one of them. Like I, I she's, if I need something, I call her. If I'm frustrated, I call like, like they're, they're, she's an awesome person, but it's, it was intentional. It did take us a while to get there. It maybe a year, a year and a half to get there. But everything we did was intentional. Exactly. I think the key word, you have to intentionally act on that and grow that relationship. And I always tell you, but you have to swallow your ego. Yep. And love unconditionally. Yep. And then just have, I mean, it's almost like a company. We have a one goal in mind, and that is to raise an amazing human and to give yep. them an amazing experience. 100%. And like, it can't be all about you. It can't be selfish. Like, yeah, hey, like I, there, there were some times, you know, during that year and a half that we were trying to build this relationship where my ex-wife was trying to figure out my wife and like we weren't married yet like she's trying to figure out what's going on because she's very protective but it's it's losing you know you can even say maybe losing a battle even though i hate to use that word but because there's a there's a there's an outcome that you want and there's an end goal that you're trying to you know get and it's being intentional with like maybe sometimes surrendering maybe saying hey you know there's there's maybe you don't get her this this time and it sucks for me but i know it's gonna you know be on yep. the other side, it's all going to work out. And I always had to ask myself, like, is this me being selfish or is this the best thing for my daughter? You know, like, of course, I always think I'm the best thing for her, but in reality, you know, is it for me or is it for her? And so you really just have to, you know, identify that and, and swallow your pride and your ego to say, you know, it's probably the best for her that she, you know, does whatever. All right, bro, tell me the story about your IT bill. Dude, my IT bill. <laughs> Man, so uh, there's so many things that I was not paying attention to. But when you have so much revenue and stuff coming through, um, it's just insane. But yeah, man, we uh, like a million seven in a couple of years in IT. And I'm not quite sure what we have for it. Um, Are but, you on the like, Salesforce? Like, where did all that um, go? Dude, equipment, um, signed up for stuff that we never even used. I mean, I got, I'm looking at $30,000 of the servers right here that I don't even know what they do. Um, I just got them from Oregon and then there's a backup server out there. So there's what forty five thousand dollars worth of servers. I think they're fifteen thousand dollars a piece. I don't know what they do. Um but they're there. 
and like we and then we had those servers and then we had cloud servers were paying a thousand bucks a month i mean there's just so much stuff that we're i mean right now i have 120 like email licenses that i have available that i'm not using that we already (laughs) pre-purchased i have (laughs) over 100 phones though these uh you know those those uh yeah link phones those you know the the voip phones i got a hundred of those that we're not using we're paying 10 bucks a month for that i can't return um there dude there's equipment everywhere i mean i got more i got seven or eight computers i got i got stuff everywhere that we're not using i got and that's just in this office exactly um, my corporate team i mean there's just so much stuff that we're not they spent three hundred thousand dollars on a security system that i didn't know that they spent because i approved a ten thousand dollar I got an email that said, hey, it's going to be about $10,000 to, to install the systems at the locations. Does that sound okay to you? I'm like, hell, nine locations, 10 grand, that's not bad. So I approved it. Well, that was the cabling that did not include the equipment. The equipment was $275,000 that they didn't tell me about. So little things like that were, I was kind of finding after the fact. Um, you know, I have more stuff places. I have a about a 2,000 page document of our IT stuff when we left our IT company that I'm, I work off of right now with passwords and different things. And I'm not gonna lie, man, I'm starting to become a really good IT guy. Um, I can hack into shit and do all kinds of stuff in our company that I probably should never, like I never was intentional, like wanted to learn this stuff, but it just, it is what it is. Like I'm, I'm head of marketing, I'm head of IT, I'm the head of sales, I'm the head of finance. I'm a sir, I'm, in, I'm the director of everything, but it is what it is. It's long hours, but it's actually been kind of fun. But yeah, I mean, we were we we're paying our IT company like twenty one thousand dollars a month for nothing. So for three years, so yeah, it's stupid. Oh my god, bro! Who's the best entrepreneur you've ever met, and why? Oh, man, that's a great question. There's so many people that I've met in different facets. Um, well, let's say who you know. Oh man, it's, I know a lot of people. Um, I got to meet a lot of billionaires, um, a handful of them. Um, some of them that you know are are loud and proud. Some of them are not. Um, you know, I one one person that I would say is my dad and my mom because they they did everything together. But the biggest thing my dad is known for is who he is, and he's never changed, and he cares more about people than he does about about money. And he's he's impacted millions and millions of lives across the planet. Um, and he's just more well known for who he is and how he treats people than he is for any company he's ever known. And I feel like, like that's true that entrepreneurs, well. you know, that's like an entrepreneurship that like you can almost take it at another level is like impactful. And he was very, very yeah. impactful with people. And like, you know, a business owner is one thing, but like being able to use your gift to impact people in a positive way and help them. Like my dad at one time. Hell, at one time in his downline in, in Amway, he had over a hundred people making a million dollars a year. And there's a l- multiple billionaires that were out of his downline and still say that they're the reason why he made money, they made money. And still to this day, he, he gets people all the time that send him stuff or go out to lunch to him and say, I, you know, I would have never made it if it wasn't for you. And to me, I mean, that's the greatest entrepreneur in the world is if you're able to share it like making money is easy but if you help like thousands and thousands and thousands of people make money that's another level so i would say my mom and my dad oh i love it and then selfish one what's the best fifth wheel to buy is it those new um what's the top of the line one that's been coming out is it the lux one so Lux, Lux is pretty, pretty popular. Our, I, I'm pretty uh, kind of, I mean, if you're full time and you're out there on the road a lot and you want something nice with a dishwasher and a walk-in shower and a walk-in closet and double sinks and king bed and, you know, washer and dryer and all the fancy stuff is a Riverstone. We sell Riverstones. We're the largest Riverstone dealer in the country and they are some of the best made. I mean, you can go out there in the middle of Arizona when it's 100 degrees outside, and your your trailer is going to be at a good good temperature. Okay, the Riverstones. Yep, yeah, Riverstones. I sell a lot of them. I sold a lot of my friends Riverstones. Keaton had a Riverstone. The one he was house. living in before he moved into his house. Yeah, yeah, that was one of our trailers, and yeah, I mean they're 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 just solid, solid, well built. They're they're built very different than a lot of other stuff. They're built more like a house, and. Yeah, I mean they're 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 pretty badass and they look good. Hell yeah, bro! Any parting words for the people, and where can people find out more about you? 
Um, no, man, I just want to say I thank you so much for being on. This has been a great, great conversation, man. I respect the hell out of you. You've, you've kicked some – I mean, I, I didn't know much about you before. I seen you on Josh's uh, social media before we spoke together, but I've been watching you, you know, ever since then, and it's just been cool and respect the hell out of you. Um, people can find me, you know, on, on Instagram. It's just Jason Haugen. It's H-A-U-G-E-N. It's Jason Haugen, my name. Um, is really where I'm most active is on Instagram. I got a YouTube channel um, with Culture Camp and Jason Haugen. Um, podcast is also on everywhere where you can listen to a podcast called Culture Camp, where I interview a lot of people, business owners about culture and their businesses. But most of recently, I've been uh, doing a little series on all the struggles I've been with my business. You can very detailed and uh sometimes a little too detailed um i'm very vulnerable with everything that i'm going through almost weekly you know like this week hey this happened that happened and you know this you know here's how we're getting through it just because my whole goal is to help other entrepreneurs and and people out there to know that they're not alone and maybe some of my costume mistakes can help someone not make those mistakes bro hell yeah thank you so much for coming on bro thank you so much for tuning in